Thank you, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you, yes. Uh, Peter Krause has been the star of all of our favorite shows over the last two decades. Sports Night, Six Feet Under, Dirty Sexy Money, Parenthood, The Catch. Now, Krause can be seen on Fox's funny, gruesome, and at times, touching 911. Let's take a look. So I want to thank everybody for donating today. I don't know if you know this or not, but 90% of all the blood given to patients in the Los Angeles area comes from volunteers. I know that we all put our asses on the line in the field every day to save people, but today you're saving people and all it's taking is a tiny prick of a needle. So simple, even Mr. Buckley can't mess that up. You still at it, huh? How'd you do? Incredible. Everyone donated. Some people even came in on the day off. That's great. All right, well, let's wrap it up. We gotta start our shift. Uh, hold up. Looks here like I am two pints shy of my goal for the day. Well, that'll give you something to work towards next time. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're the captain of this house, and you're the only one who didn't participate. I don't like needles. End of story. Oh, come on, Captain. Come on. You gotta donate. I don't give blood. All right? I never get blood. When I was a kid, they tried to take my blood, and I bit the doctor. <laughs> it's not funny. And the one time someone tried to take my blood as an adult, <laughs> didn't go well. Everybody, Peter Kraus, let's hear it. <laughs> Sir, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Happy to be here. OK, great. Uh, 911, uh, as I said to you in the green room, this is like a procedural on steroids. Uh, and I love it for that reason. It takes sort of a, a something that is well worn on TV and turns it totally on its head and injects it with steroids. That is an excellent description of the show. What, would it, what did you think? How did they pitch it to you? How was it presented to you? Uh, I had a meeting with Ryan Murphy, and as he put it, it's going to be adrenalized and it's going to move. And he, he did this a lot. You know, the show is going to do this. <laughs> and uh, and then he started telling me a little bit about Bobby Nash's backstory. And the way he described the character to me was very compelling. And so I walked out of that meeting and I was like, I want to do it. How much is, uh, is it about for you when you jump onto a show, what, who the character is and their backstory, as you said, or the entire show itself and the premise? Like, have you ever signed on to something where the character wasn't there yet, but the premise was really there? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've signed on to some things where the character and the premise weren't entirely there. <laughs> uh, you don't but, have to name names. That's no, I, no, I won't. But they, they, they didn't go uh, the distance, you know. Um, it's both. It's both the character and then the whole picture. And of course, I've always wanted to work with Ryan Murphy. I don't think anybody has um, as broad, uh, you know, a, a resume on television as he does in terms of what he's been able to do with Nip Tuck, all his FX shows. Um, broad, the, but I would say still within a kind of signature Ryan Murphy style. Yeah, quality. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. The way that I mean, this is essentially a, it's a procedural injected with Ryan Murphy. Now that yep. now that we say it, yeah. So what, talk about your character in the in the backstory. What did he tell you about him? Uh, well, he described to me that uh, Bobby Nash had caused a fire in his past due to his substance abuse, and he lost his kids. And so that was something that I knew I was going to have to deal with as the actor, you know, as as Bobby Nash on the show, which is very interesting to me. Yeah, that's such a heavy thing that you can kind of bring to every scene or every yep. moment that could be weighing on someone or in the back of their head. Yep. But so we, we move through that in the season. I can't tell you what happens, but right. Bobby gets, I don't know if you guys have seen, wait, has this episode been on? This has been on, hasn't it? This the, one has been on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you kind of get to see where uh, he gets to let go of this burden that he's placed on himself of having to save 148 lives before he takes his own life. And so we're going we're gonna to move beyond that. What is it like getting the chance to work with, uh, with Connie, with uh, Angela? It's pretty uh, amazing It's cast. been great. Angela's been fantastic. Connie, I haven't gotten to work with too much, but uh, I've known her personally for years. Um, it's a great cast all around. Aisha Hines, Oliver Stark, Kenny Choi. Um, the fire team became a family very quickly, and uh, they're a great bunch. How so? Did you guys do some team building exercises, or is it just... Um, well, everything on the show is kind of baptism by fire. You've got to do it on the day. Um, we have wonderful consultants from the firefighting world on the show, but uh, there's an episode where there's a plane crash, and that episode was filmed over the months of October, November, December, and January. It took a really long time. We had to film out at Dockweiler Beach, which is the beach that is just outside of LAX. Um, you can still have bonfires there, which is interesting. So if you want to go out to LA and have a bonfire and watch giant 747s fly over you, 
uh, it's a pretty cool experience. Yeah, that's kind of cool. I want to uh, do that. Yeah. Um, and that's where we filmed the first part of the plane crash. But, of course, we weren't allowed to put a plane in the ocean and, you know, film that. So they dug a giant hole at Disney Ranch and filled it with water. But not before they constructed a cradle to lower an aircraft into it by, by crane. So you know, they purchased an old aircraft. They had welders out there building this cradle. And once they got the cradle done, lower the aircraft into it and then start filling it with water. Uh, I think the coldest it was at night was in the upper 20s. So there were some nights where Oliver and Aisha and I, because they, they had this floating ferry of a dock that they'd you know, rope tow away from the plane. So you knew you're stuck out there in the middle of this man-made lake. And they'd start the wave machines, and it was windy. And so being stuck out there, there are times, honestly, just for warmth, the three of us would huddle together <laughs> as close as we could. And Oliver, I joke with him because he's a vegan. He got the coldest first. And he'd start to really shiver, you know. And Aisha and I would just kind of huddle around him. We had, we had secret scarves tucked in the overhead compartments that we could wrap around ourselves and kind of tuck up against the plane when it was windy. Um, it was a tough shoot, but uh, it's, a, it's a pretty cool episode. Would you say that the, the shoots for this show are some of the toughest you've sort of ever had for any of the projects that you've done? Physically, definitely. You know, uh, Six Feet Under was difficult emotionally, but okay. I mean, I've got bruises all over my body from this. A lot, a lot of kneeling, a lot of carrying other human beings. Um, that stunt actually there that I did, I don't know why I keep pointing to this thing because that's where I saw it, um, where I hit that medical tray. I had a big bruise on the inside of my left heel for quite a while. Just, but it's all, it's all the, worth it. Just the slapstick. It's the all front, worth it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you have a, uh, there is an episode where you essentially wrestle a snake. Yeah, that was our first episode, yeah. That was a giant python. It's an albino python. It was 12 feet long. So well, hold on. They yeah. give you the pilot. They say this is going to be, this is the first episode. You yeah. Read it. Did you ask if it, the snake was going to be real? Did you ask any questions or were you just like, I trust that this will go well? I, I went that direction. I trust this will go well. They had a latex model of the snake. You're like a director in a producer's dream. Like, and, no uh, questions at all. Just you just got to go for it. In the Ryan Murphy world, you just got to go for it. And uh, at a certain point, the snake handler came up to me and said, would you like to meet Angel? That's the name of the snake. And so I went back to this room, and the head is over there, the tail's over there, the middle of the snake is as big as my thigh. The head of it's like my hand and a fist. And so I had to handle the snake. And it, at first, I thought, I'm going to be fine. I'm walking back to the room, you know. And then the, the sound of the hiss from a snake that size would fill this room. It's very, very loud. It's like, a and it's just breathing, you know. But uh, <laughs> just looking at it in the room, I started to feel a little sweaty. But then when I had to go out and actually handle the snake, the snake handler said, now, if, if she starts to fight you, just let her go. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what, what else am I going to do? Of course I'm going to let her go if she starts to fight me. Just like fight back. But, uh, <laughs> Throwing punches at yeah, the yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but if you hold a snake like that from underneath, their head feels free and they can kind of move around and you can guide it. But they wanted me to hold it from above, which is where you get a little resistance. And at one, one point, the actress um, playing the woman who was being choked by the snake was actually it was starting to tighten around her neck. And she started saying, it's tightening, it's tightening, it's tightening. And so I let go. They rushed in, and they, and they got the snake off. What do they do to get it off if it's tightening? How, what are they uh, you know, they're snake people. <laughs> uh, Magic. Know? They're snake people. They, they, just, they do what snake people they do. They speak snakelish. You know, I don't know. It's, uh, well, it it's, like it's this. wild for me to see people who are that comfortable around reptiles. The small ones didn't bother me that much. Um, there was a moment when Oliver is walking by the snakes that they've placed in these, uh, you know, branches as we walk in. This one snake just started going right towards his head. <laughs> I never seen, I saw Oliver just like <laughs> his head by. But, uh, yeah, those were real snakes, and the, the large one was terrifying. Are stunts like this sort of are one of the reasons that you signed on, that saw, signed on to the show? Were you excited to take part in something yeah, like this? Yeah, it's a blast. You know, there was that, also that first episode where I had to be on top of a... Uh, a shipping crane, which is about 125 feet in the air. And I usually don't have any problem with heights. I've climbed mountains and things like that. But the, the surface was a metal grate, so you can see straight down. So you take this, you know, rickety elevator up to the top. I got out. I was feeling fine. I'm looking around. And then I, I looked down, and I could see straight down because it's a metal grate because they don't want anything to collect up there. And all there is is one bar to hang on to. You know, you could slip out from in between, or you could go over the top. And at that, at that moment, 
I'll never forget, I, was, I grabbed that bar so hard, you know. But that was when the woman is, uh, she jumps off the edge of the building. And, uh, Did you have lines from up there that you had to do? Yeah, I said, I know what you're feeling, I can help you. <laughs> and of course you see that she jumps and so... Uh, that's all you had to say, that's okay. I mean, if you had yeah. like a monologue up there, like trying to remember while you're... It wasn't, it wasn't real life. long. But uh, when that promo aired, my friend Scott Simon texted me and said, I hope you don't mind if I'm feeling like ending it all, I'm going to call somebody else. Because <laughs> um, you were up there. like I, I was up there like, and she just, okay, yeah. okay, I know how she you She says, feel. yeah, nobody can help me. And she goes over the edge, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, was your, what was the first show that you, that you got in your career? Was it, was it Sports Night, the sort no. of first big? Uh, back in 1990, I went to school right, right over there at Tisch. I don't know which way is that, because this is... It's right there. It's right there, yeah. So, yeah, so there's the Gallatin division, and just beyond that is uh, Tish. That's where I went to school. So this was Tower Records. But I'll, I'll get back to Tower Records in a minute. No, we can talk. We can get back no, to the other thing. But uh, I did a show with Carol Burnett called Carol and Company in 1990 right. on NBC. That was my first TV gig. And that was a, re a regular role that you had? Yeah, I replaced Jeremy Piven, of all people. He had done the first half okay. season. I don't know why, but uh, the next... The next season that they did, um, they recast with me. And then you also had a, a, a cameo on Seinfeld, which yeah. I see quite regularly, because I watch yeah. Seinfeld reruns on a regular yeah. basis. Yeah, the uh, limo. The limo. No. Yeah. What was, uh, what was it, what, what season was that? Was it known I'm as a not, show yet when I'd you did it? I have to look back and see what it was. The show was just getting really hot. Right. Like it had been on for a while, and I haven't seen all the early episodes, but this is when they started to really get some traction. I think that he still did the opening stand-up, stand -up, didn't he? Yeah. Um, but the show was starting to be the, the show that we know now, which yeah. is just like as many story beats as possible. And They were all great. Um, one funny moment was we're in the back of this half limo on a soundstage at CBS Radford. Jerry Seinfeld reached over into a candy dish. They have these candy dishes in limousines, right? Pulled out a hard candy, was sucking on it for a while. We're like, okay, now we're going to do the scene. We're going to call action. Spit it out into the wrapper, tied it back up put it back into the candy dish. And I looked at him and said, what are you doing? He says, like, somebody's going to have a little surprise. <laughs> that was it. Jerry Seinfeld. He's still got, he's still got that, like, chart, that juvenile comedian in him. That's yeah. Gotta, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Put it back in there. <laughs> uh, that was a good experience, though. But, yeah, I used to buy cassette tapes here because I was at NYU in 1987. So I didn't have a, I can't remember, when would the CD players come out? Right around that time, right? CD players, yeah, 86. like 86. It was yeah. like a 90 was when people really started buying them, I think, yeah. 90, 91. Well, they cost, they cost some, you know, some yeah. serious coin back then. But anyway, I would come over here, and this is where I'd get my Robin Hitchcock and my Amazing. Velvet Underground and whatever else I was listening to at the time, Grateful Dead, whatever, right in here. Robin Hitchcock, good pull. He's yeah. great. Yeah. The yeah. Soft Boys, you know, some of the, so the, the early Hitchcock stuff? Uh, Black Snake, Diamond Roll, that was one of the albums, yeah. Yeah, he was Robert great. Hitchcock a lot. Yeah. So I asked, like, what your first show was, because you have these shows that we know and, and, and love, and 911 is such a kind of, a, I think, a, I feel like a departure for you in a lot of ways. It was Did you ever see yourself doing a show like this? Yeah, I've always wanted to do a wide variety of things, and I've been able to do that. I think that whether it's Six Feet Under, Parenthood, Sports Night, this, they're all different. You know, I, I never wanted to do just one thing. Yeah. So I hadn't done anything like this before. The one thing I've tried to avoid, or two things, are lawyers and doctors. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You have avoided that. How, <coughs> how have you done that? Um, I just haven't chosen to take any of those roles. They've been offered, though. Uh, when Six Feet Under went down, they asked me to join ER, and I just was like, no, I don't, I don't need to do that. I get enough medical, medical speak on this one. There was a moment. You don't want um, to say stat. Um, in this, in this uh, <laughs> series where, did you guys see the baby delivering episode in the, in the yoga studio? So I have that line where I say, you know, you're suffering from HP, HP, uh, HPD, uh, no, C CPD, cephalopelvic disproportion. And I was joking in between takes, was, ah, oh, you're suffering from chronic phallic deformation. <laughs> and uh, of course, then I get to do the scene, and I'm like, that's all that's in my head. So it took, you know, a lot of focus and determination to get out. So they have cephalopelvic multiple takes of you saying chronic phallic deformation? I'd get some of it out, and then I'd stop myself. And, but yeah, medical, medical is tough, yeah. as well as legal, legal. You just, don't want to have, you just didn't want to have to learn the, the yeah. jargon? I did play one lawyer. That's not true. I played a lawyer uh, on a Fox series 
a long time ago, like 94, called The Great Defender with Michael Rispoli. Do you guys know who he is? Wait, who's Michael Rispoli? That Michael Rispoli in The Sopranos is the guy that Tony Soprano replaces. He's the mob oh, yeah. boss that James Gandolfini's character replaces. And he's, the, he's got the son in the first couple seasons yeah. that like, they have prob Jackie Jr. Yeah. He's Jackie. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sorry. And, and Richard, <laughs> and Richard Kiley, who is Man of La Mancha on Broadway. He played my grandfather. But I played this kind of Tony Blue Blood Boston Crosby Caulfield III. And I had this like Dutch boy paint can hairdo. It was awful. Um, yeah. you, you are also, I would say, not cast as doctors and lawyers, but often cast as good men. I hope so. Like, I've never seen you really cast as a bad guy. Usually Some people like, didn't like Nate Fisher on Six Feet Under that much. But Nate Fisher was a good, was trying consistently to be a good man. Well, I always felt like he wanted to live an authentic life. That was my take on that character. And sometimes trying to lead an authentic life, you're going to hurt the people around you because you're not going to be who they want you to be. And uh, certainly in his romantic life, Nate wound up hurting a number of people. A number of people. What did you think yeah. of his... his uh, Spoiler alert, demise at the end of Six Feet Under and the whole funeral sequence is really one of the most heartbreaking things I've ever watched. Also, I, I felt yeah. slightly exploitational <laughs> in a way that I loved. Well, Craig, Craig Wright, who was a writer on the show and ended up creating Dirty Sexy Money, uh, his take on the show is that Six Feet Under is a machine designed to kill Nate Fisher. That was how he described Six Feet Under. Um, I, I love that character. I love that show. Um, one interesting aspect to doing television is that you live with this character's psyche alongside yours for however many years the thing goes. And, you know, that, that psyche ran pretty deep, you know. Uh, I feel like it bled a little bit? Yeah, at times. It was not always a fun day at work on that show. Yeah. It was heavy emotionally for all of us. You know, I think if you ask that question to Francis Conroy, Michael Hall, or Lauren Ambrose, whomever, Rachel Griffiths, we all say the same thing. Yeah. No, we were not having fun every day. <laughs> yeah, not, not every day on that one, though, for sure. <laughs> uh, let's get some questions from our audience. Yep. Who has a question? Right he here. Someone's walking. Hey, hey. Peter, thank you for being hey. here. Sure. Um, I mean, when you're on set, are, do you feel like you're the most grounded, or do you feel like the other castmates are? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's tough to say. I don't know. I, at this point in my career, I feel pretty grounded. But uh, on 911, I'd say everybody's pretty grounded. Oliver's, you know, he's half my age. He's 26. And so he's giddy. Like, he's always just like, what are we doing next? You know, and he can't wait to get to work and things like that. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Right here. So which uh, co-star of yours has paid the biggest impact on your career, would you say? Oh, wow. Um, well, in, in terms of looking up to people, uh, I got to start out with Carol Burnett. And then, even though he wasn't my my dad on Dirty Sexy Money, um, he was kind of like a father to me, Donald Sutherland. Certainly Richard Jenkins on Six Feet Under, and then Craig T. Nelson on, on Parenthood, just as sort of father figures, if you will. I got to have some pretty good ones. Um, they were great, all, all three of them. I mean, Richard Jenkins, such a great actor. Uh, Effortless. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of effort there, but he's one of the many actors, or one of the few where on screen, it's just like, this feels totally effortless for you and yeah. perfect. Yeah. And in terms of grounded, tying these two questions together, Craig T. Nelson, getting to do a scene with him as an actor, there's, there's nothing better. Just his heart is so open and he's so ready, and like the listening is all real. And you also don't always know what he's going to say next. You know, he's. Uh, he throws curveballs. He's great, yeah. Yeah. Well, parenthood kind of great. allows that, right? Because parenthood yep. is a sort of mixture of scripted and improvised. Yeah, a little bit. Like, we'd always try and get it, you know, as written and then start to kind of riff off of it and things like that. But, uh, like, there was a thing in the show where uh, the character of Adam Braverman was a dancer. You know, he fancied himself a dancer. And they'd written something else. And then I did a take where I said, they used to call me Fever from Saturday Night Fever. And that became a thing on the show where it became... Adam Braverman's nickname to the point where I'd walk into the gym that I was working out at in, in LA and there were a couple of trainers who'd be like, Fever! Fever! <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, I think I have time for one more question. Hi, uh, Peter. I'm a big Peter Krause fan and uh, I really loved Six Feet Under and Parenthood and now the 911. Uh, which show would you say, and I think you kind of addressed it a little bit, uh, took the largest emotional toll on you during the course of the show? Um... Uh, up, up to this point, I would say Six Feet Under. You know, Parenthood was a lot more of a hopeful television series. Uh, but this takes its toll as well. The nice thing about this is that it's counterbalanced by getting to do 
heroic things. So, very funny things as yeah. well. It, it, in a lot of ways, it's a very goofy show at times. Yeah. I, I mean that as a compliment. Yeah, I think that Ryan Murphy, as, as you see in most of his work, he'll decide what the boundaries of the show are. Right. You know, not the audience or anything else. It's like, yeah, we're going to do that too. So uh, I don't know what's next, but I can guarantee you that it, it'll be as exciting as it was the first season. I love that we get to do all these different things, and there are some big surprises coming up. Oh, yeah? Do you want to tease yeah. any? I can't really. <laughs> they have to do with some of these people right here. Um, 911 on Fox. What night is it on on Fox? Fox? Wednesdays. Wednesday nights yes. on Fox. 911. It's a great yep. show. Peter, thank you so much for being here. I'm thank a big you fan. very much. Peter Thanks Krause, for having everybody. me. Thank you.